All right, what are we doing? That gets my goat. I thought we had retired that. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Gets My Goat. I am Big Anklevich, and here with me is... Rish Outfield. Um, and he brought along the proper enthusiasm. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, there's only so much to go around. Somebody else is borrowing mine right now. <laughs> per- perhaps it's you. Yeah, there we go. So today is part two of our crossover episode. We're having a big crossover event. All the cast and crew from The Flash and The Rish Outcast (laughs) are in on this uh, crossover event. Did you watch that last one, that really big... Was it Crisis on Infinite Earths? I, I, yeah, I, cry. I, di- I didn't. I heard about it. Like they had the uh, the Superman that's like the the old one, the one that's like got gray hair on the sides and he's the last thing left alive in the universe or something like that. Yeah, they had Brandon Routh playing Superman again in that, right? Right, that's right. Which is weird because they've already had Brandon Routh playing uh, the Atom. Is that what he was called on that show? It was Ray Palmer, I remember they would say, and... I'd always be like, don't give me that. That's Superman. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, if you missed the uh, first part of this episode, it's over on the Rish Outcast, uh, which you can find uh, if you search in (laughs) iTunes, I think. Right? Oh, that's funny. I don't know. I don't have an iTunes. Um, I regretted it last time I went there. Yeah, I'm sure you can find it over on Stitcher, right? You can find it over on Pod... I, remember Pod. Podcast Pickle, by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> you can find it on all your favorite pod catchers. Probably. Maybe. I think... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we talked about that once, that uh, eventually, if you have enough episodes out there, your podcast just shows up on those pod catchers, right? Yeah, I'm not sure how that happens. Yeah, I'm not I think sure it either. might have it's to do something with where it comes from or what its service it's going through originally or something like that. But I think you can find it out there. If not, you can go to uh, richoutfield.blogspot.com and you will find episodes there. And you can click the link. And you, you can just put a link to it in this post. I guess I could do that. Oh, wait. I can put a link to it in this post. So, yeah, I don't know if I will or not. You could do that, too. I always liked the idea that, you know, just people that I that knew me and liked me listened to my podcast. But uh, apparently that's not the case. People that dislike me. No, it's it's it. yeah, it's just the ones that know you. There is no not any that like you. I'm afraid. <laughs> anyway yeah so this is part two of that we talked about last time around the writers conference that rich outfield attended this month and we talked a little bit about just writing in general and some of the things that rich learned at his conference we went over them discussed them uh talked about whether we agreed with them or not those kinds of things, and maybe shared even some of our own insights, if you can call what we have to say insights. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. But we only made it part way through the conference. We still had plenty to go. <sighs> yeah, I feel super indulgent doing the second episode of it. But there were a bunch of things that I had told you. Hey, you got to remind me to tell to tell this story when we do the episode. And we finished the episode, and you said uh, I, I didn't remind you to say any of those things. I was like, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, I'd forgotten what they were even at that point. And then you reminded me what they are, and now it's been a week since we last recorded, and I have once again forgotten what all of them were. So I hope you remember them. Do you remember them? I remember one of them. Oh, that's good. We can talk about that and see where it goes. But yeah, in case people didn't listen to the Rish Outcast, this is the leavings. This is what we didn't get to, so F you. (laughs) <laughs> I, every year in February, there is a writer's conference in my town, and every year I go, and every year I call Big Anklevich to tell him what I've learned. So this should be no surprise to you unless you're a new listener. And if you're a new listener, hi, I'm Rish Outfield. 
I like to make fun of myself. And I'm Big Anklevich. Um, welcome. Yes, welcome. So uh, the second day that I went, uh, I went to a panel called Balancing Work and Art. And it seems like that's super useful for everybody, whether you have a part-time job, whether you have two jobs, whether you don't have a job and you're an inmate, but you still want to create, uh, there's never going to be enough time to do everything. And this panel was, uh, it was interesting because everything they were saying I already knew. Which, <laughs> uh, for example... I thought you said it was interesting. Well, it was interesting to just hear people's examples of what they do. And it's something that I complain about every year, is that there's always got to be... Uh, big, you're familiar with the four Yorkshiremen sketch by the, uh, the Monty Python troupe, right? Yes, I'm quite familiar with that. Can you just, like, briefly sum up what the gist of that sketch is? Luxury. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, the four Yorkshiremen, and uh, they're talking about what it was like when they were children. And each one of them is trying to one-up the other on how hard they had it when they were children. And so they would say, oh, when we were kids, it was like this. And then the other one would say, oh, luxury. We used to dream of having something like that. I don't know how good my Yorkshire accent is, but uh, it's... it's. I don't either, but it's a great sketch. And it's just, you know, like we, we grew up in a cardboard box. And it's like, oh, we used to dream of a cardboard box. But that, that there's, always, there's always somebody at one of these panels who has to let you know that they've got it worse than the other people. And so there's always somebody that says, you know, I have to wake up at six in the morning to write before seven o'clock, before the kids wake up to go to school and all that. And somebody else is like, seven o'clock? Oh, <laughs> on Christmas, maybe I will get up at seven. I have to get up at 5 a.m. There's always somebody that has to do that to just show you how dedicated they are to their art. And some, for some people, I'm sure that's super inspiring. For me, it's all just, it's, it's a joke. It's the four Yorkshiremen <laughs> where the, they all lived in a, in, in a corner of a septic tank. <laughs> and uh, anyhow, um, there was a lady, though, on this balancing work and art panel. And her story really spoke to me in this same way of, but, you know, then... But that boy and girl were glad because one kid had it worse than that. Once there was a writer whose husband didn't support her in artistic endeavors, just like Biggie Anklovich. <laughs> he couldn't read anything that his wife wrote. She couldn't quite explain it. He was just a douche bag. Mm -hmm. So this lady said that her husband, that she had made the mistake of expressing to her husband, you know, I have to write. It's so important to me. I'm a writer. And he's just like, yeah, oh, no, that's, that's fine. Let me see what you're, you're writing. And this was early on in their marriage. And uh, he didn't like it. He thought that it was a waste. It was fantasy she was writing. And Ew, fantasy. Yeah, he's not a fan of fantasy, and he's just like, ugh. God, why would you waste your time with that? And it so hurt her feelings that she had to decide to never share her work with him again or get a divorce. She also said that she had three kids and the teenage ones never let her have her time to write. That she had told them, explained to them, I need this time. Uh, I only have so many free hours in a day and I need this time. And the kids just don't care. And I, it's got to come from the dad's influence, right? 
these things don't spring out of nowhere. Or maybe just kids are terrible. <laughs> but she'd say that, you know, they would come and bother her and be like, you know, Adam ate all the cereal, mom. And she's like, this? You're interrupting my writing for this. And so what she actually did was she built a panic room in the house. Like, I guess there was a storage closet or whatever, and she described the size of it. And it's like a walk-in closet. It's like six feet by four feet or something like that. She put a door on that with a lock so it can lock from the inside. And then there's a hall. And she had her husband put a lock on the door to the hall so she could double lock herself into this panic room. And that's where she goes to write. And she says it still doesn't work because the kids will get the keys to unlock the two doors just so they can complain that Adam ate all of the cereal. And so what she has to do is set her alarm for 2 a.m. She wakes up and from 2 to 4 she goes into the panic room when she knows that the kids and her husband are all sleeping. And I just, it was a horrible story. I had never been so grateful to sleep alone. In fact, I've never been grateful to sleep alone. <laughs> so actually, she did me a favor. She finished that story and you said, look, Shere. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had it hard. Oh, we dreamed of a panic room. <laughs> we dreamed of Adam eating all the cereal. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about that just for a minute, because um, uh, you can relate, as the uh, Crash Test Dummies explained, when I called you and told you about this, that, you know, her husband was just like, why you waste your time with that? And the way, and she, uh, you know, obviously this is a sore spot for her, and she's the person on the panel, not her husband, but there just seemed to be so much disdain in the way that she you know, quoted him of why would you waste your time with this? Um, but, but it just, oh, it, it, it kind of broke my heart a little bit because writing is so important to me and it really does go a long way toward me be, feeling sane and feeling like I have some modicum of control in my life. To be a hero, to be cool, to be loved, to be a success. And then, you know, just the idea of somebody, ostensibly the person that is most important to you, not getting that or deriding that, it just, it's, it, that's terrible. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you told me the story, I did say that I could sort of relate. Not... In the same way, uh, my wife doesn't disdain what I do. She doesn't stand in the way of it. She doesn't purposefully, you know, keep me from, from writing. But I have had a few experiences in the past that have taught me not to share things with her. It's kind of weird, I think, because... She is very much a reader. She reads all the time. She loves to read. She doesn't love any of the kind of books that I like. And I've tried to get her to read. You know, I have got a whole... I, if you've seen any of the videos that I make and stuff like that, I, I sit in front of my bookshelves uh, for all of my videos. I've got bookshelves just filled with novels they're all fantasy and science fiction and horror novels and i've lent s many of my favorites to her and said oh this is one of my favorites why don't you try reading that and she'll read like man i was i mean it was okay but you know, it just do they don't speak to her in any way like they spoke to me i don't know if she just didn't watch star wars when she was a kid <laughs> what it is uh why she it, it just doesn't speak to her at all. But yeah, she doesn't like the kind of stuff that I write. And I've, uh, you know, I've shared some of the, you know, the same complaints that Rish Outfield sometimes has about my writing. About how, you know, the baby always dies at the end or whatever. Yeah, my wife t 
took those endings way harder than Rich Outfield or anybody else ever has. Um, she really didn't like my penchant for the uh, dark Caught. ending that I have had in the past and sometimes still have. But yeah, I had a couple of experiences where, I, you know, once I had a story that I was working on and I was proud of myself, I'd gotten really far. I'd written like, I don't know, 10, 15 pages, just a, a lot, probably like six or 7,000 words. I was writing a, no, a novella at least, maybe even an actual novel by the time I was done. And I shared with her... Uh, the early parts and she wasn't impressed <laughs> and she said she didn't like the character the character was just too dorky too nerdy and she just couldn't get into this character and care about what happened to him kind of a thing and and it made me think oh maybe i should change this character maybe i should do something else with him and then i started planning my rewrites for this book i'd never even finished it in the first place and i was planning the rewrites and of course what actually happened was that i stopped writing altogether never finished that story and uh, but i did learn a valuable lesson and, and i've heard it said many times since uh, as you never show a work in progress to someone you you just can't do that because then that exact thing will happen every time that you do it. You don't show work of progress, even to someone who's supportive, who's only going to say something nice. You just, you can't do it. You'll find a way to torpedo yourself if you do that. So I learned to never do that because of that. But then later I showed her a different story and she also didn't like that one. And, you know, I've showed her many stories and she's liked some not liked others, but each time that she doesn't like it, I take it poorly. <laughs> and it feels to me like she doesn't like them more often than she does like them. Now, that may not be the case because, you know, as people always say, it takes like five or six or 10 or 20 compliments to outweigh one negative comment. So it's possible that that's what the uh, ratio was but the negative ones were always the ones that I remembered and I and and I swore after the second time that I just couldn't share stuff with her because she's not the right person to be my first reader <laughs> as it were and so yeah I, I can understand that issue. I don't know who a good first reader is, unfortunately. I would like to say that Rish is my first reader, but he's too busy writing to be my first reader. <laughs> so, Yeah, that's true. You sent me a story about two weeks ago, and I said, I'll read that tonight, and I still haven't. Yeah, I think Rish's comments would be really welcome and probably really good, but he's not going to manage to get around to doing it because he's doing too many other things. I don't know how you find a good first reader. I would be happy if anybody's listening to the show and they want to give it a shot. Uh, I have a novel that I'd like to, uh, that I finished, that I'd like to hear comments on. I'd like to know what they thought of it, what they think I need to do better. Because, yeah, that's one of those things, and I, I've mentioned it a lot of times before, but, you know, Dean Wesley Smith says that every time you write, you should have something in your mind that you're working on, you know, when you, when you write, you should be practicing something. You should be getting something better, you know, working on getting better at something every time that you write and, you know, you'll become a better writer that way. That makes it practice. If you just write over and over and over again without thinking about how to make it better, without working on something specifically, then it's not really practice. But, you know, if you know what you need to work on and you work on that, then, you know, it, it can make your writing improve. So, you know, I'd like to have something like that. I don't know how you come by it. I have had one person read the novel so far. Dave Wallace read it for me, so that was nice. Mm. And he gave me some comments. But yeah, anybody want a free novel, they can read. It's called Sunny and Gray, part one. Yeah, you've got to be pretty close to... Uh... Finishing Sunny and Gray Part 2 by now, right? 
I am, yeah. I'm really close. I'm maybe 10,000, 15,000 words, something like that, short of finishing that one. It's like in the 70,000 word range now. Part of the reason this Writers Conference episode is so big this time is because this is the first time I've ever had a laptop that I could take to the conference. And so I took tons of notes on every single panel, whereas in the past I just had to jot them down in my notebook. But yeah, one of the things they were saying is uh, that you can burn yourself out. So you need to take a break, uh, take a walk. A lot of writers go for walks and they think about their writing while they're doing that, plus they get exercise. One of them does meditation and yoga. I don't know if those are the same thing. Uh, One of them listens to music. One of them switches from one uh, creative project to another so that they don't burn out. You know, it's like a, one, a story that they're drafting and then a story that they're editing, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, and then maybe a story where they're just outlining. And uh, something that they stressed, which I have heard a hundred times, and that probably means I've told you over and over again, is that you have to have a place that you go where you, th- you create art so that your body gets used to saying, okay, no, this isn't the place I check my phone, this is the place I do my art. And one of them went so far as to say, have a time set aside every single day where you do your art, so that your body gets used to that. Okay, this is the hour uh, when I do art, or three hours in the, uh, the guy on the panel's case. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, lately you've been writing at work during your lunch break, and have you found that that's been helpful? Yeah, it has. It's been helpful. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't do it in a special place where, you know, there's no distractions or anything like that. There's still the internet right there on my computer. I could could go to that anytime. I've heard some authors that actually have separate computers for doing the different things like they have a computer that is just for writing and they use that computer and it doesn't have an internet connection yeah it doesn't have an internet connection doesn't have any of the programs that go with that stuff even loaded on there it's just got a word processing program and that's it i guess if you can (laughs) do something like that then you can do something like that. That's not really a possibility for me. Having a, a time to do it is definitely helpful, though. Yeah, I mean, I have my lunch breaks. Uh, unfortunately, what I really need to start doing is, is doing a time earlier in the morning before I go to work and see if I can work on that. Because I have a tendency to, I don't know, drag my feet, whatever, during my lunch break sometimes. Some days when I just don't feel like it, I don't push as much as I should to try and get things done, and I wind up not getting it done, not getting my whole 1,000 words for my goal done within the time that I have allotted, and then I wind up coming home, still having several hundred words to write, and then I sit down on my computer and I surf the internet and I look at Facebook and I look at Instagram and I look at Twitter and look at eBay and I look, <laughs> I just look at everything but the writing. And I wind up being up until two or three in the morning, which has been leaving me very tired. Then, of course, the more tired I am the next day, the less likely I am to push to get those words done again. And so it, it, it just keeps compounding on itself. And uh, I think maybe if I just pick the time, you know, like right after I take my son to school, I come home and I write for an hour every day. It has to be from this time to this time. You know, that might work. An hour should be plenty of time to get a thousand words in. Just got to do it. What's the fastest you've ever written a thousand words, if you had to guess, sir? I may have written that even in a half an hour. I'm not sure. I know that I've written a few hundred in, you know, like probably 515 minutes, I know. So it's possible that I've written a thousand in a half an hour, but I don't know. 
I don't time it, you, you know. Okay, I just, I don't know. That was a dumb question, I guess. <laughs> Sometimes we hold ourselves to a standard that is not realistic. And some of the things that the Yorkshiremen say in these panels, I recognize is not realistic for me. I'm not a neophyte. I'm not a little kid. I know that I'm never going to get up at four o'clock in the morning to write. And so there's no point in beating myself up that I don't. And you stay up until two in the morning to write, though. I, I do. I'm well, OK, maybe I'm a bad example uh, because <laughs> I'm I'm doing it this month. But and, and so are you. But, you know, there's that guy out there that we can't compare ourselves to. You, you can only do so much. And a lot of times we focus on what we were not able to achieve instead of saying, well, 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 wait a minute. Look how many words I did get in or look how close to my novel, to finishing my novel I am rather than, you know, I said when I was X years old, I would be a professional writer. Maybe I should be on one of these panels, but I don't know that you hear that enough. It's probably not helpful for people to hear that. People need to hear no, 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 you got to sacrifice it all if you want to be up here, if you want to be a winner. But I don't know. We've achieved quite a bit just in this month back to back. And you've been doing it since your birthday, improving every single month. Yeah, I have 86,000 words that I've written since my birthday. It was just keep trying was basically all there was to it. Don't give up each day have that goal of doing it and, and do it and just push to, to work more each day. Eventually, I've gotten to where, you know, last month I only missed two days the entire month and this month I've missed none. So you just build on the last. Okay. So uh, another panel that I went to that you and I talked quite a bit about was called Judging a Book by Its Cover. And uh, it had various, I don't know what you'd call it, people that are in the, the business. People that are super hot? No. No, they weren't. Well, then how, you judged and, and them poorly, right? You said these that's, people that's one aren't of the worth listening to, right? When you looked at them and saw how ugly they were? Well, but I, writers, I don't need to say anything else. Oh, yeah. they were writers? <laughs> now these, these were okay for example uh tony daniel of bain books was one of the people on the panel and he is part of the i expect you to editorial. die what <laughs> i expect you to die batman that bain books right oh that bain when <laughs> gotham lies in ashes you have permission to stop writing <laughs> he he he's what part of their design staff or something like that i mean one of the things that he is in charge of is cover art for books and then there was somebody uh who does all of the art and covers for he who shall not be named <laughs> and uh you know other stuff like that and the bane books guy said that you merely adopted the darkness i was born to it no, he, he, said, <laughs> he said you do want to judge a book by its cover. You, uh, you want the cover to tell the audience several things. One of them is th what the genre is. One of them is what the tone is. One of them is what the age group intended is for. He said it's important that somebody sees the cover and says, Ooh, that looks like a book I would, I would like. But it's also important that somebody who's not going to enjoy your book will see that cover and say, no, nope, that's not for me. And, and I was just like, really? That, why would you want to push people away? And I guess you want people that will love your book. You want people that will come back for more. Something that somebody said at one of the panels is, 
a writer's success is not gained by readers of their work. It's gained by re-readers of their work. People who love it and are going to read it again and spread the word to everybody else that this is a book you've got to read. He said, the first question you should ask yourself is, does my book cover look like it's self-published? <laughs> He says, in other words, does it look like there was a team of professionals that put it out? Or does it look like something that will be full of typos? <laughs> he said, even if it is self-published, you don't want it to look self-published. He said, if you don't pay for anything, if you don't pay for an editor, if you don't pay for advertising, the one thing you want to pay for is your cover art. And these were hard truths to hear because my cover art often is not good and I'm aware of it. And there have been times when I've not published something or I've put it off over and over again because I didn't have cover for it. And there have been times when I've just been tempted to put out a black cover or a white cover with just the text on it, just so I can get it out there to, to stop myself from not putting it out, from using that as an excuse, because a lot of times that's, that's what I'm doing. He had this quote, and I found this really interesting. Let's talk about it. He said, if your book is great and the cover is not, it's still a great book. But if your book is only pretty good and it has a great cover, that cover can save it. Hmm. I guess I can see that. You know, people see the cover... And then they maybe hear the premise and think, oh, yeah, this is, I'll give this a shot. Whereas, you know, other times they see the cover and it looks like crap and they don't even bother to read further and see the premise or any of that kind of stuff. They just go, oh, self-published, moving on. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can see that being the case that, you know, if you're good, if your book is so-so, and but it has a great cover, it'll at least get in front of people's eyes and people might like it enough to recommend it to somebody. They might enjoy it. But if it's got a bad cover, I mean, for the most part, that's all anybody sees is the cover. You know, you go to Amazon or something and you get the title of the book and then you see a little rectangle with the, you know, the cover in it. You know, maybe it says James Patterson on it or something. And you're like, oh, okay, I know that guy. I've read his stuff before and I can decide from that whether I like it or not. But, you know, that it's not going to uh, help. It's not somebody that you know. you got to look at that image. And like you were saying before, you know, the image should tell you what the book is about, what kind of a book it is. So, you know, like, for example, my wife who doesn't like the kind of stuff that I write, will look at a book that has a painting of a knight fighting a manticore on the front and will be like, oh, yeah, that's not a book for me. Whereas, you know, me, I would look at that, oh, my gosh, look at that manticore, so freaking cool. I'm getting this. Or at the very least, I'll look at the premise and see, why is there a manticore? <laughs> Well, that, I think that's exactly what he was talking about. They, they said, you don't want to get negative reviews. It's better that somebody doesn't buy your book than that they do and give it a negative review. Uh, he said negative word of mouth is just as powerful as positive word of mouth. The cover to your book is your biggest tool in getting it into the right hands. And they talked about like overly complicated covers, like sometimes an author will have an idea of, I want these 16 characters all on my cover. And it's like, no, you don't want it to be that busy. They talked about like hiring somebody to do the layout of your cover, of where, uh, you know, how big the text is, what the font is going to be, how close to the edge of the side of the book it's going to be, and things that I had never considered. You know, they, they showed examples of cover art and passed them around of art for books that they had published. And uh, sometimes they didn't have the text on them, but you could see exactly where the text went because the artist had left a space 
And they said, you know, it should look unfinished if it doesn't have the text on it. And, and, and so that was something that, you know, I have to keep in mind. It's still a huge stumbling block for me, but uh, maybe, the, you know, half the battle is knowing that uh, it's something I need to work on. Yeah. They also talked about, like, going to deviant art or finding artists that can do commissions for you or that can that have already done art that you're like, oh, that would work. Uh, apparently there's a website out there and I don't know that I jotted down what it was because I've got here Deviant Art, Art Station, CG Trader. And I, I, I don't know if any of these are what they were talking about, but there's places where you can just find like free images that uh, as long as you acknowledge where they came from, you can use them for your like self-published books. And they said, but there, there are certain images that are so good you can do like a reverse image search and like 15 different self-published books come up with that cover. Or maybe 15 is an understatement. One of the guys said that there were a million books self-published a day. And I just thought, ah, is, that, is that possible? I don't think there are a million people who can read. <laughs> but it, have you, you? it seems like you have done that. Back in the Steve days when you would have to do a cover art for a story every other week or every month or so, there would be websites that you would go to, I remember, uh, to try to find art. Yeah, I, I would go to Flickr a lot and get uh, photos that could be used with Creative Commons attribution. Um, and there's other places. There's a place that I go to a lot to get just clip art, just simple pictures and, you know, sometimes even something like that, depending on what you're after, can work. You know, uh, your cover doesn't have to be all that complex. It can be relatively simple. If you go to, like, Amazon and just look at, like, all the best-selling covers or the covers for best-selling books, a lot of them are pretty simple. You know, they're just a picture of a landscape or something like that. Some of them are just a big black cock a uh, square with maybe a tiny little picture in in the middle with you know the words of the title and the and the author and and that kind of stuff much larger so you know it doesn't have to be super complex although again you do have it, it does depend on what you know you're publishing so if you're looking for <laughs> Fantasy books. Let me see. Fantasy books. Yeah, see, like the fantasy novels that come up are a little more... Uh, elaborate? A little fancier. Yeah, a little more elaborate. Pictures of dragons and uh, paintings and kind of neat-looking things. Kings and queens and stuff like that. But, you know... Sometimes uh, you got crappy covers. Like, for example, we were talking about it when, when you called me the first time right after this panel happened. We were talking about the cover for Ender's Game. <laughs> and for the whole Ender's Game series, I guess, because uh, Speaker for the Dead had a similar cover and Xenocide and Children of Mine, they all had the same really crappy cover that looked like it was... The cover for a video game from the 80s with like really lame CG spaceship on it. <sighs> you know, that was garbage. But yet somehow that still sold plenty. I guess that's the uh, example of what you were talking about where a really great cover can make a book that's so-so really go. But, you know, if your book is great, you know, it may still be able to overcome a crappy cover. And I guess that's what happened with Ender's Game. It had a crappy cover that people look at it and go, uh, doesn't catch their attention and make them all interested. But, uh, you know, the story was good enough that people talked about it anyways. But yeah, the covers in sci-fi are a little more fancy too. A lot of just space pictures, stars, pictures of spaceships flying in space. I wonder about horror. I bet you horror, it, you can get away with a much more simple cover design, right? It does, does the font sell your book more than whatever's on the cover in horror? 
Uh, well, there's some pretty dang creepy covers on here, so maybe. <laughs> but yeah, I would say the font does give you the idea of what kind of a book you're you're looking at. If you give it, you, a lot of them have that kind of really off font. It's broken or splotchy or there's something something different about it. But yeah, they're not necessarily super elaborate. I think you could probably get away with something more simple. I mean, you know, we, we talk about the cover. You mentioned the one for Jurassic Park. Right, which, it's just a white cover with a T-Rex skeleton drawing on it. And yeah, they, they used that as an example. They held that up and I guess that was 1991. When did Jurassic Park come out? Something like 89, that. 89, 91. And, and I think they still use that image on the book. And it's just, it, it tells you everything that you need to know, I guess. Yeah, it's not anything too intense. You don't have to have something really crazy as your cover design. I think you can get away with something that's still relatively simple as long as you give it a decent design, the font and the other things. But it does seem like it's really important. I think it is something that, you know, people will look at and they'll be, you know, they say never don't judge a book by its cover, but that's how you judge books. You can't judge a book by reading it. You have to buy it first. And you can't buy a book without judging by the cover. So I guess that's just the way it is. And that's definitely something I think we both need to work on. Yeah, I, uh, I'm aware of that. Anyhow, uh, let me see if there's anything else that we wanted to talk to you. Do, do you remember if I've already, in the first episode, if I talked about, and I know what you're going to say because I don't remember either and I would have said it, how some people said that you have to get the F away from social media and other people said you have to be on social media every single day. I don't think you talked about that. Okay, well, on the last day, I went to a panel called Shameless Self-Promotion. And this one was, this one felt more like a multi-level marketing kind of thing. <laughs> well, it is Shameless Self-Promotion, after all. Where, yeah, they're just talking about, it, like, I, I did it, and you can too, in these 17 steps. You know, you want to become a better person. Subscribe to my master class and this lady that was running the panel was so positive uh, and in everything that she said it felt super polished it felt like some kind of presentation it felt like she was selling herself rather than a product and that I have to admit made me a bit cynical the thing is everybody has their own secrets to success. So what was Michael J. Fox's secret to his success? Uh, it's that he's living 25 hours a day. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> everybody has all of these things that work for them. And the trick is you can't do all of it. You can't even do a small percentage of it. You have to find what works for you and just stick with that. Uh, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try some of these things and see if this works and if that one works. You know, the, the getting up at four o'clock in the morning, the finding a place that you only write, you know, the, the laptop that has no internet access, going for walks, recording yourself, talking about your story while you're on your drive for work, et cetera, et cetera. And th there are certain things that will work for you and there are certain things that won't. Uh, but I don't know that you'll find out what they are unless you try them. Right. In this panel, she was just talking about flogging what you have to offer over and over and over again until it becomes what you do. She was clearly not one of those people that had a problem getting up in front of people and saying, the thing that I have to offer is so great, you will regret if you don't buy it. Unlike the girl that I talked about in, in the, uh, the previous episode who said, you know, her hand, she held up her hand to show how it was shaking, that she was so afraid to be in front of all these people and to be vulnerable in front of these people. And, and I just, yeah. But like one of the things that this lady said was, and I, I wrote it down with quotation marks, I have like 
40,000 followers on Facebook. She was talking about all the different accounts that she had on Facebook, each with a different purpose. She had one for her business. She had one for her writing. She had one for her friends. She had one for her close friends slash family. She had one where she talked about politics. She had one for her public speaking engagements. And she posts in all of these accounts all of the time. She was just talking about how important it is for you to connect with other people through social media, for them to be reminded that you exist, reminded of what you stand for, reminded of whatever it is you're selling, and that it just seemed exhausting. <laughs> she talked about like how many tweets she sends. Uh, if that's what you do, you send a tweet? I think you tweet a tweet. Okay, well... Twitter absolutely sucks. So let me just skip that paragraph. <laughs> but she was just talking about like, you know, I all these things that you can learn, you need to to do. And oh, she, she had us do these activities where she's like, write down all the things that you can think of that you do well. And she gave us like three minutes to do it in. And, and then she's just like, you know, post this up someplace where you can see all these things that are good about yourself every single day. And I was like, oh, that, that's nice. And then, yeah, she, she was there to promote a seminar that she has. And she said, let me bring up somebody who's been through my seminars and can tell you for a testimonial. And this student came up and gave like this gushing recommendation about how the seminar changed her life. And immediately, like, all my alarms started going off. Because it was just like, oh, I've been part of organized religion. I know what this is. <laughs> it freaked me out. Just, yeah, I was just like, oh, gosh. And, yeah, they had these acolytes. The, among them was this girl that came up and said, you know, before I met you, I was nothing, no and nobody. I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get a date. I couldn't stand to see myself in the mirror. Then I got to know you. They had these people standing at the door and they were hand us these pamphlets so that we could go to the seminar. And the seminar is insanely expensive. And But if you use like the promotion code because you went to this shameless self-promotion panel, you could get like, you know, a 25% off discount. And, and, you know, we've all heard about these things or, or you've seen the masterclass commercials at the beginning of something on YouTube or, you know, uh, who was it that had seminars that we used to think about going to? David Farland's ones we're talking about. And, you know, I think about those sorts of things and, 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 there's a good chance that some of them would be really useful. You'll hear about the people that go on like retreats, you know, for a week or three days or 10 days or whatever. And they're like these writing workshops or, you know what I'm talking about, right? Mm-hmm. I can't think of the name of it, but yeah, there's writers workshop. There's ones where like, uh, you know, where you, you have to, you send them a story and you have to apply to it. And then you go and you live there in like Martha's Vineyard with them for like <laughs> a month. And you have to write every day. And, and you get to put that on your resume or on your website that you're a graduate of this yeah. program. And I, I wish I could think of the name of it. It won't come to my head right now. But most of the writers that you like know of in science fiction all did that. Paolo Bacigalupi and uh, Tobias Bacchel. Bacchel and yeah, you know, uh, I'm sure I'm totally wrong. Those two never ever went to it. Clarion? Oh, Clarion West. Clarion, Clarion and workshop, Clarion yeah. West. Yeah, I, I, I don't know about that. I, I, I know we have talked in the past about like getting together with people just to go on some kind of writing retreat for three days or, or you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and I, I think there, at one point I even kicked around the idea of just having people come here and stay at my family cabin because that's not going to cost anything. That might be really, really cool. Uh, and for me, you know, all the, what's attractive about that is being surrounded by other creative people and just having fun, having friends. All of that so stuff sounds really really good. 
I, I, I even thought about us doing like a virtual writers group or something like that. Something that I talked to you about one of the days where I was just like, what if we took like three hours on a Saturday in March or something like that? And we do a Google Hangout with people that like us and we workshop a story or something like that. And it's just like, okay, you know, if you got anything out of this, we'll do it again, you know, in May or something like that. You get all of these ideas when you go to these panels, when you're surrounded by the infectious enthusiasm of creative people. And then I guess the trick is once that's worn off, do you still do it? Yeah. Um, I mean, that could work. You could do it just once a month or something like that. You all get together and do your Google Hangout. And uh, maybe you do one story a month. So, you know, you have a certain number of people. And But yeah, the, the problem with that is, yeah, how many times you have to get together before they finally get around to your story. <laughs> could be really interesting. Something to try. Well, we had tried it in the past to just do full cast stories where we got a bunch of people virtually in a room together and everybody recorded their things. And, you know, that sort of went away because everything sort of went away. But it sure was nice to hear the voices of people that we know or that we, you know, only known from Facebook posts and all that stuff and if there were people that felt like that was a really good use of their time, there are always more stories that we could f sit down and, and try and record in that way. It's just, you know, if, if it's important to them, then, you know, maybe we should consider it again. It's just all that stuff is so hard. <laughs> I, I know it's a broken record, but it's just, yeah, the writing every single day and blogging about it every single day and just, you know, word count and, and all that stuff has taken a lot out of me. I'm glad that I did it, but I, I know it was just like two days ago where I said, okay, I'm kind of winding down. I can feel like this isn't going to happen anymore and I'm not as productive as I was. I'm not as inspired as I was. There's just, I can't do it. And then today, <laughs> I wrote more today than I have any day since we've been doing this. So I guess I'm full of crap. <laughs> uh, you just like to rub it in my face, huh? Because I barely make it to a thousand every, every day. <laughs> no, no, you told me that you're over 50,000. I'm not even close to 50,000. So I may have written more than you today. But you've been doing this a lot longer, and and that's more impressive than what I could manage on one Monday in February. Anyway, we're both winners in this scenario. We all we in. Nobody is the dog. Nobody is a dog in this scenario? Wait, who is the dog? You. You are the it dog. It has to be a dog. Okay, thank you. That's better. Yeah, so, sorry, I, I don't know how useful this episode has been f to people. Let me just sum up by saying that the keynote speaker of the seminar was a man named Brad Torgerson, and he is a writer of science fiction and seemed like such a nice, good, decent guy, and all he talked about was trying again working just a little harder, not being discouraged. You got rejected. Send in something else. Oh, you lost that contest. Send in something else. And oh my gosh, his, his keynote was really, really moving to me. I just, I, I really liked listening to this guy. He works insanely hard. He has a full-time job. He is also part of the military reserve. Is that what you call that? Yeah, the National Guard where, you know, his weekends are taken up by that. He's a church guy, so even more of his weekends are taken by that, or every possible spare moment that he has might be taken by that. But he's also a real writer, and he was just talking about being a kid and coming to this seminar when he was a boy and saying, I want to do that. I want to get up there and be a writer. And it took him all these years, and it finally happened. Uh, he talked about uh, Larry Niven being the writer that most inspired him, that most spoke to him. 
And he's just like, I want to be like that guy. I want to. And, and he talked for almost an hour about his craft and how he just fell and failed and, and screwed up and then tried again and got up and brushed himself off and tried again. And finally he won novel of the year. And Larry Niven was the guy that gave it to him. Uh, Oh, it was heartwarming, dude. He, uh, he was a, he, he struck me as a decent, jovial, positive guy. I, 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 he was the kind of guy that I wished I had more of in my life. I wish I knew more people like that. I don't know how much time you want me to talk about this, but but yeah, that's the thing that he kept beating over and over again was you don't appreciate what you don't work for. Michael Jordan learned more about playing and getting good at basketball from the games he lost than any of the games that he won. His uh, success, quote unquote, it took way longer than I thought it would, but it was better because when it finally happened, it was way more important to me than it would have been if it had come early. That, dude, I, hearing stuff like that just, it makes me, it, it just makes me want to go the distance in Rocky Parlance. My uncle showed me this clip from America's Got Talent. And it was of a 60-year-old guy who was still trying to make it as a comedian. And it was more inspiring to me than all of the Billie Eilish teenage successes, stories that I hear all the time. I mean, just to see this guy up there and he says, I've been doing this my whole life. It's what I want to do. I'm 60 years old and I'm just happy to be able to perform in front of you guys. And they applauded and they, I I mean, I don't know what happens on America's Got Talent. They pushed him on to the next level or the next go round or, you know, they voted him up. Uh, They didn't press the buzzer on. They didn't gong him or whatever. But I was just like, oh my gosh. They didn't drop the 16 ton weight on him. Right. Apparently they don't do that anymore. Because it upsets Katy Perry. No, I don't know if she's even on that one. <laughs> but I just, that was inspiring to me. I don't know if that stuff works for you. But just the idea of a 60-year-old success story speaks to me. Yeah. Yeah, the, the thing with keeping on trying just seems very important to me as well. And maybe it's just because I'm old now. <laughs> <laughs> and so if I was to believe that if the only way I could make it was to be, you know, do it so early in life, then I would be too late. So I have to believe that it's late, possible late in life or something. I don't know. But yeah, just the idea of keep keep trying, keep going. You know, like I was saying earlier, I, I, I can't remember how many words I said. Let me click over. I've made it to 86,000 words since I, uh, you know, started on my birthday. And... Are you sure you said 86 before? Because I just said 50. <laughs> yeah, I said 86. Wow. You said I, I've written more than 50, but... Well, then um, I was still technically right. <laughs> right. And the reason that that was the case is because the next day I did it again. You know what I mean? I didn't just... Hey, I did it. Yay, I I achieved my goal. And some days I didn't do it. There was plenty of days that I didn't. There was one time where I didn't do it for nine straight days. I wrote absolutely nothing. But then I buckled down and I forced myself to write. And I wrote again and I got back to it. Just keep going. Just keep swimming, as Dory would tell you. (laughs) You know, you just, you can't quit if you really care about it. You can't quit for good. You can't give up. And it's the same kind of thing as, uh, you know, I've I've also been trying for a long time. I've been going for even longer at trying to lose weight this year. You know, I've been going since May with that, which is another four months or more on top of uh, the writing thing. And it's the same kind of thing. There are days when I screw up and I eat stuff that I shouldn't eat and it's completely slams the brakes on any progress that I was making and I could you know give up and just be like well I ruined it I guess I'll just go back to what I was before or 
you know, you just start again the next day. Go back to square one and start over and try again. You always just got to keep trying. And each day you get a little bit better. And then someday you'll write 3,000 words in one day. Could happen. You, you, you know, you probably have to be like some kind of superhuman person to make it happen. But it could. Yes, a Sandersonian person. Yeah. But the important thing is that I write again tomorrow. Yeah. That's a greater achievement than what I achieved today. And this Torgerson guy, I just, I wanted to give him a hug afterward. I have so many notes that are just like that Michael Jordan thing. These, these were things that I needed to hear. He said, when you succeed later, after trying and struggling and failing, it's so much sweeter than if it had been easy if it had just been handed to you. I still get rejections, he said, even with the success I've just mentioned. Stories still get bounced back at me. It just happens less frequently, and when it does, listen to this, it hurts less. Mm. Isn't that just exactly, well, I don't know, because you and I are not the same person, but it it's what I needed to hear. I, I love <laughs> to hear that stuff. It's like he meant it for me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like when you hear a song and you're like, oh my gosh, this is exactly the way I feel. And then you, you, know, you find out that he wrote it about his dog. And you're just like, <laughs> what? But that's, that's how I felt about this guy. And I just, yeah, oh my gosh. The only note from oh, there are two notes from his keynote speech where i i kind of have to scratch my head one of them is going down the crack train okay and then i have a question mark next to it what the heck does going down the crack train mean maybe that's what you were you were like trying to decide what you wanted to do after the conference was over that night ah and you were coming up you know brainstorming ideas what should i do later ooh <laughs> Be maybe going down the crack train. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good, man. I, I I just I saw it here and I was just like going down the crack train question mark. Good stuff. <laughs> the other thing was that there was a girl that while I was, you know, eating up everything that this guy was saying, a lady next to me was playing Plants vs. Zombies on her phone. And I wrote, I am so jealous of this lady. I could, I could install, install that, that app on, on my, my phone. phone. And, and oh, the, the joy, joy it, it would, would give me. me. But well, what, what would I lose? What would I trade for that? Because I'd have to trade something, even with what little sleep I'm getting. To me, it just isn't worth it. And nothing against video games. Nobody, except apparently Brandon Sanderson, can do everything. <laughs> you know, speaking of Brandon Sanderson... I'm listening to the third book in the uh, the Stormlight, Stormlight Archive. Archives called Oathbringer. You know, I haven't gotten to the payoff of this, but they keep asking this question. You know, one of the characters is, you know, trying to become something special. And more than once, the question has been asked, what is the most important step a man can take? And... I don't know the answer to it yet because they I haven't gotten, I guess, to that portion of the book. Or maybe it won't even be in this book. Maybe this is a teaser to later in the series, book 14 or something, you know, when that finally comes around. When somebody else takes up his mantle after Brandon Sanderson has died and does a Brandon Sanderson for his book series the same way that he did for Robert Jordan's book series or something like that. But uh, I think one time... The character says the most important step is the first step. But every time I hear that, I think the the answer, I think, to it has to be the next step. If you hadn't said that, I would have said the that. The next step is the most important step that a man can take. Like you said, you wrote 3,000 words today. Well, that doesn't matter anymore because today's over. Michael Jordan scored 60 points in last night's game. But that doesn't matter anymore because that game's over. His team already lost that game. <laughs> now he's got 
to win the next game or he's not going to make the playoffs. The next step, I think, is the most important step a man can take. And I don't know, I'm assuming that's, I, I'm guessing that that's going to be the answer in the end. At some point, the character's going to be wanting to give up and uh, somebody's going to have to give that to him, that answer, and he's going to be realize that he can't give up and he's got to keep going. But yeah, I think that that's the case with anything, especially with writers. Who cares that I wrote a thousand words today? It doesn't matter if I don't write a thousand words tomorrow and then I don't again write them the next day. I'm supposed to get 300,000 words this year. I'm not going to make it if I don't write basically every day. So, you know, I've got to keep doing it. And that's just the way it goes. With, with anything that you want to do, you got to keep at it. You can't quit. The next step is the most important step. That's great advice. I hope that there's somebody listening. Because if there isn't... <laughs> well, you know what? If there isn't, then you and I got something out of it. Yeah, there we go. And I'm going to see the glasses half full. But I hope that there's somebody listening that needed to hear that. It doesn't matter what you have accomplished in the past or how many times you failed in the past. You got to get up and take that next step. I mean, take it from me, dude. You, you, nobody is as much of a loser as me. And here I am. I'm still dreaming. I'm still hoping that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that there is a happy ending out there, that there is success graspable. Maybe that's a definition of insanity, but it's also progress. It's also, uh, hopefully, inspiring to somebody in the same way that this man's Success was inspiring to me. Don't dwell on those mistakes as much as learn from them. And to try again. Shoot, help me out here, man. I, I think you're doing fine. Yeah, definitely uh, just keep at it uh, and keep on practicing. You know, make every day a learning experience and you'll, you'll get better and better. And yeah, the, the, I think the most important thing is just never give up. Never give up. Never surrender. Tony Shaloub's right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Let's take this to heart. I hope that uh, you have enjoyed something from these two episodes. And, uh, I, you know, I, I believe in you. I believe that there is a success story in everybody, especially people who like the Dune Steve. Like, they're, just, they're just a better class of person. Yeah. You, you have to be. <laughs> and uh, I think that's where I will leave people. That sounds good. If you have not succeeded in writing every single day, that doesn't mean that you can't start. Yeah. That doesn't mean that you've lost forever. You only lose if you give up. There you go. You only lose if you stop trying. I'm going to try to l take my own advice here. So uh, thank you for joining me yet again on this uh, That Gets My Goat Big and listening to me, hopefully, say something you needed to hear as well. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks for being with me here and, and talking about this stuff. I had a good time. Uh, we'll do more like this in the future, I'm sure. Yeah, I think I, you've been listening to some stuff that's been helpful for you. Maybe we'll regroup and I'll just ask you some of the things that you've learned. And, and here's another crazy thing. By the time this episode airs, you will have finished that second Sunny and Gray book. How, does that not blow your mind? <laughs> that's, uh, that could very well be true. Make it true. Make it so, number one. Engage. I have been Rich Outfield. And I've been Vig Anklevich. See you next time, folks. The next step. Yeah. Ah, Soundwave. What have you learned from your reconnaissance? Great Megatron, we have surveyed this area and discovered two things. One, a small mine found to contain enough raw materials to produce 47 energon cubes. 
Good, good. And the other... That the That Gets My Goat podcast has been produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 No Derivatives License. What does that mean? That the podcast is free to listen to, download, and share liberally, but it cannot be altered, sold, or made claims upon. I don't understand. One cannot credit the podcast's content as their own, nor can they attempt to sell it or make changes to it. No, no, you fool. What in the name of Unicron is a podcast? Merely more evidence in the inferiority of these flesh-based earth creatures. Yes, Soundwave, and it will make it all the more satisfying to crush them. Indeed, Lord Megatron. Indeed. Just make sure you podcast it when we do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, on the last day, I went to a panel called Shameless Self-Promotion. Shameless Elf Promotion? Like promoting elves? Yes. Like for fantasy writers? Hmm. I don't know why we're talking about elves. That's weird. I think only one of us is. Oh. Uh, What did you say? I farted. Oh, (laughs) no wonder I didn't understand. I think you may have cut out for a second when you were talking over my connection, so maybe I missed something. The panel was called Shameless Self-Promotion. Oh, that makes more sense. Sorry. I thought there was some pretty good stuff in there. Oh, I wasn't recording. (laughs) I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.